If everyone can take a seat, we are one board member shy of quorum, but that board member who will get us to quorum will be here in a few minutes. So we will begin so we can st uh, start on time and end on time and move through our informational agenda items to begin with. We'll, we'll hold on anything requiring a vote for our remaining board member, Sahar, to join us. So good morning, everyone. I'm Andrea Guerrero. I am the, uh, the co-chair of the RIPA board. And I welcome my fellow RIPA board members this morning and uh, members of the public and law enforcement agencies who are here, as well as the Department of Justice. We have come very far. We are on the verge of issuing our second report. We are on the verge of issuing, of getting reports in from the Wave 1 agencies, and we'll hear from Wave 1 agencies today on, on how it's going and get their early assessment and recommendations on how to move forward. But we have come far. We have come from concept and vision to legislation, to implementation, to reporting with best practices being drafted in the current report that we're going to consider today. And so I, I want to congratulate all of the stakeholders in getting us this far. It's been a group effort uh, and it's, it's really been unprecedented. And in an era of heightened, uh, heightened rhetoric and hate being spewed in all directions and, and sometimes having real life consequences. Uh, it takes a lot for people to come together, reach across the table, reach across uh, real and perceived differences and try to make long-standing change that will affect generations to come. So let's continue that work today and um, we now have our, our final board member getting us to quorum so we can proceed with the agenda as it's laid out. So welcome everyone. I do wanna give uh, the board members an opportunity to make any welcoming or introductory comments if you so wish. No, all right, we're all feeling welcomed. Okay, my co-chair, Sheriff Robinson is not here today, so I will be chairing this meeting. And we will begin with a formal call to order now that we have quorum. And we will look to the minutes of September 26th. And I will invite a motion for their approval once you've had a chance to review them. Do we have a second? second? Wonderful. All in favor? Uh, All opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Minutes are approved. We will now turn to an update from the Department of Justice. And that will come from Aaron. Not at all. Good morning. Someone? Okay. Uh, good morning. Thank you all so much for being here. It's my pleasure to be here and honored to be here with you this morning. My name is Erin Choi, and I'm a program manager at the California Department of Justice, and we have a number of other resources from DOJ here as well. Um, to kick things off, we wanted to provide um, a short update on the status of data collection and uh, some of the various things that are underway. Uh, so we are going to go through a brief PowerPoint. Uh, so at a high level, we've um, outlined these uh, three discussion topics for today's um, update. Uh, first and foremost, uh, to provide you a status of the reporting that's underway uh, with what we call the Wave 1 agencies. Uh, these were the agencies that were due to start collecting as of July 1st. Uh, then also an update on the work we have um, underway with the Wave 2 agencies. Uh, those are the additional seven agencies that are going to start collecting stop data effective January 1st of 2019. 
And uh, then we also wanted to provide um, kind of a, a quick overview of the review process, which is one of the features that we have in the DOJ hosted web application. Uh, so first and foremost, um, an update on the Wave 1 agencies. Uh, just as kind of a recap, uh, there's eight agencies that have a thousand or more uh, sworn peace officers that started collecting as of July 1st, and uh, this gives you a breakdown of the different methods that they've selected to send data to the Department of Justice. And then as of this month, uh, we currently have four agencies that are uh, submitting their stop records. So since the board last met at end of September, uh, Riverside County Sheriff's Office has started sending us data, as has um, San Diego County Sheriff's Department. So in total, we've received over 300,000 stop records so far. And um, of those submissions, um, approximately 4,000 errors have been generated. Uh, so these are things that um, are not critical in nature, uh, but we are working closely with the agencies to resolve. And then moving on to the wave two agencies. Um, We've had a, a, a very busy time working closely with them. Uh, so uh, here are some of the key activities um, that we've been working on. Um, most recently, uh, we've been working on um, doing testing with them, doing training, uh, getting their accounts set up. So um, everyone seems to be on target to start their data collection as of January 1st of, of 2019. And this is the breakdown um, listing the agencies that are going to be starting to collect and the method that they have selected to transmit data to DOJ. So two of the seven are going to be using the DOJ hosted web application. That's Fresno PD and San Jose PD. Uh, so um, DOJ uh, conducted what we call train the trainer sessions with them uh, starting back in October uh, through the beginning of this month. So you can see the numbers there, but um, we've trained over um, 400 local trainers that will be responsible for um, taking the information forward to the officer level. and. All of the officers have now access to the DOJ training environment so they can be entering test records, um, making sure their account is all ready to go for, for January 1st. So these, these two agencies that are using our web application have been working especially close with us. And then last but not least is the third item that we wanted to touch on this morning. At the last board meeting, um, we had some discussion about the error resolution process and when the data could be modified, um, by who, et cetera. Uh, so we wanted to just um, kind of follow up on that to um, bring kind of one additional topic for the board. And that's to explain um, how that featured is handled in the DOJ web application. So we essentially give agencies two options. Um, option one is um, that when an officer collects the stop data, they do a final review and then they click to officially submit it to DOJ. Uh, so it's the responsibility of the officer to make sure that it's complete, that it doesn't have any personally identifying information of the subject involved, and then once it's submitted to DOJ, it's considered final at that point in time. And then as a second option, um, we um, kind of allow for a second person to do a review. So this would be for a supervisor to review it. And um, once the officer collects the information, the record is flagged with a status of pending review, uh, essentially sitting in a queue for a, a supervisor to come through and do a secondary check to ensure that um, it's complete and that there's no, for example, personally identifying information in the record. And then that sec second person submits it to DOJ. Um, there are rules around that. Uh, some data um, cannot be modified at all. Uh, so for example, um, one of the things that the system will never allow to be modified is the perception data, because that would be unique to the person conducting the stop. Uh, so really the purpose of that review feature is mostly focused for the narrative fields um, to make sure, for example, that the location does not include an exact location, um, because if it was a call for service at someone's residence, if that exact residence was put in the uh, location field, that would be contrary to what the regulations are uh, requesting. So there are some um, limitations, even for the supervisor. They can't edit everything within the record. It's primarily to address the location for stop, um, the reason for stop narrative, and the basis for search narrative. Um, and uh, we 
kind of make this an option for the agency to decide what's going to work best for their workflow and um, how, how they want to implement um, this locally. With that said, uh, we are looking ahead to 2019. We want to constantly be improving and be responsive to any feedback that we are receiving from the users. So we are planning to add some additional features. Um, one of the things that uh, we'll be working on in 2019 is to develop um, a true mobile application. Uh, the um, website that we're hosting can be used on phones and tablets, but it's just like pulling up any other website. Um, it's not a specifically designed mobile application. Uh, so that's an area that we want to improve upon. It should make it a little bit even faster, hopefully, for officers to complete the entry. Um, we are kind of doing some brainstorming about how we might be able to enhance that review process as well. And uh, then we're also um, getting some feedback about possible additional reports that could be developed for the agencies. Okay. Uh, so that's all the information that uh, we wanted to touch on. But if you have any questions, um, please feel free to let us know. Or we, you know, we can also address something during a break, too. Are there any questions from board members? No? Okay. Well, thank you for the presentation and thank you specifically for addressing the, um, the integrity issue. I really appreciate that. Yes. All right, let's hear your updates. Um, so I just wanted to give you all um, a, a short, a quick update on what um, is going on with the video that was to be hmm. um, shown in conjunction with the release of the report. Um, given the fact that there's really not a whole lot of time to get the, the quality of the production done that we would like to do, um, we think we came up with a really good um, alternative, which is, I thought it was on which would, would be to um, do a production and start working on it now. Um, this is the data integrity focused video and then release it um, a, approximately March 31st, April 1st when the first wave of data is to be um, received by the Department of Justice. And we felt that this would give us um, you know, an opportunity at that time. It makes sense to do it that way and then the video will, will be able to um, sort of get a little bit more um, attention than it would if it was released in conjunction with the report. Um, and one thing that we did, we looked, it looks like the video from last year, which was, um, was fantastic, but not necessarily sort of like the level of quality that we want to do for this year. That video got up over like 2,000 views. Um, and then we also, I think um, Doug had asked how often our report had been downloaded. Um, we weren't able to go back and look at when it was first, um, when it was first released, we could only look back about, I think, 30 days. But in the month of September, the report was downloaded 300 times a week. So wow. if you extrapolate even that out over a year, that's about uh, 15,000 downloads, and we would anticipate that when the report was first released, there would be a higher rate of downloads per week. So the report got um, very good coverage last year. Um, we're, we're going to be continuing to meet with our um, press office and our comms folks this week. We're going to you know, do the same format we did last year with having a, a, a press release. The Attorney General's office has a very wide um, lo state, local, and national um, network of, of press contacts. We're going to use social media as well. We have, uh, we're going to send it out to our LEA um, um, email groups and servers. Um, you know, we'd like the board to continue to send it out to their 
to our folks and get the word out that way. Um, we also will be sending it, obviously, to the governor's office and the legislature, and then our AB 953 email uh, listserv, which is up to about almost 1,400 um, folks that we email the, the board notices on a, on a regular basis. Um, and, and then we're going to also focus on the timing. Obviously, the, the report has to be released on January 1st, and so we're going to try to maximize the timing so we get um, you know, widespread exposure without you know, bumping into the holidays but meeting our mandatory deadline. Um, so that's, um, that's the outreach, that's the video, and then I do want to just note that as we're about to turn to the presentations from our law enforcement um, partners, we had two um, agencies that weren't able to be here today, uh, the San Bernardino County Sheriff and the San Diego County Sheriff, but they have submitted letters that will uh, you know, address certain the questions that we are going to be um, asking and hearing from, um, from, from today, and we'll provide those to the board um, via email. We, we didn't get them in time to send them out ahead of time of the board meeting. Riverside. Oh, I'm sorry, Riverside as well. Okay. Riverside Sheriff. Great. All right. Thanks for those updates. Are there any questions from board members? Sure. So the, the video that we've been discussing, we're working with um, a consultant, Rebecca Hetty from Spark, and we are looking to um, create a video that will help um, explain how the, the data is being collected by law enforcement and how law enforcement is maintaining its integrity. We're also, so we're, we're thinking of having um, three different voices. One voice would be law enforcement voice, another voice would be community members, um, also talking about the importance of data integrity, uh, and then the third group would be academics and how they would use the data, how the data can be maintained and kept with integrity and how they will be using it in a way that will instill confidence in the public in the results that are presented. Is, is it gonna depict how the officer is collecting the information on the street? In other words, somebody like Ma a mock stop, for example? So, that was another concept that we did have, and that would be, if we did do that, that would be a separate video that would not be done at the same time as this video. So that second video um, was an idea that was floated as a possibility of releasing for next year's report, where we actually do um, a, you know, a walkthrough of a stop, go through the form and show how the form is filled out. Um, that way we can start that production possibly now if that's something that um, you know is, is, is in, of interest and then um, have a video ready and to go with next year's report. So um, this, the first one would be focused on data integrity and the second one would be focused on going through a stop and walking through the process. Any other questions? No? No. Okay, great. Well, let's turn now to the presentation by Wave One Law Enforcement Agencies, and we'll have an opportunity for discussion after the presentation. So, DOJ, do you want to facilitate that? Should we just call? So um, Kevin Davis is here from the California Highway Patrol. Is he captain? I'm sorry, Captain Kevin Davis. <laughs> uh, am I on here? Uh, thank you. Good morning, members of the board. It's an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Kevin Davis. I'm an assistant chief with the CHP, and I work in our enforcement and planning division. Um, I know we've been asked to keep our comments very brief, so I'll keep them. Oh, I do I'll keep them very general today. Um, just in the way of background, as some of you may recall from our prior presentation, uh, the CHP began collecting demographic data in 1999. Uh, that was the result of a direction from then Governor Davis to do a three-year pilot project to collect demographic data, which we then 
voluntarily continue to do so up until July 1st of this year when we transition to RIPA data collection. Um, the data that we had been collecting, and the reason I bring this up is for our agency, it wasn't really a new thing to begin collecting demographic data. It was a practice that our personnel were familiar with and used to. Uh, obviously, the regulations developed by this board and DOJ expanded the requirements, which required us to develop a more robust and new system. So with regards to data collection, we developed a custom application. It's called our activity tracking system. And that tracks not only all of our required demographic data collection, but all of our stop and activity as well for officers working the road. Um, generally, the way it works is uh, when an officer completes a stop, they enter the data into the system for officers in patrol vehicles. That's done via their in-car uh, mobile digital computer. And we also purchase tablets for all of our motorcycle officers to allow them to do this roadside as well. Uh, once the data is entered by the officer, it's subject to a series of validations. Uh, to ensure the data is complete and thorough and all the requisite fields have been completed properly. Uh, if it passed those validations, it's then electronically transmitted to the officer's supervisor for review to ensure, again, that the narrative fields are correct and that there is no PII information included. Um, from that point, the data is then goes to a server at our headquarters in Sacramento. Um, and although we have not yet begun transmitting data to DOJ, our plan is to begin transmitting data 30 days after the stop to DOJ. Uh, what we've been doing for the first quarter, just to ensure the data is complete and accurate, and especially to ensure there's no PII in those narrative fields, is we've been having a secondary review at our headquarters level to ensure that there is no PII in the narrative fields. One of the biggest challenges that we faced is for the last you know, almost 20 years, our officers have been required to enter PII in a comments box when they collect their demographic data. So a DL number or a license plate number. So we're still having that same requirement in a comments box that appears very close to the narrative box. So we've had to work with our officers and train them and remind them which box is which. We've added separate headings to distinguish the boxes, but that's one of the challenges we've encountered. When an officer enters their data, the data is locked. The supervisor or headquarters, no one else can amend the data. So when we discover errors or issues, the data is the, the, the form is then electronically transmitted back to the original submitting officer for correction to remove the PII or whatever the case may be. Um, the data is then submitted to DOJ with a web-based services method. Um, uh, just, just to give an example of the volume of data we've collected, we've averaged just under 200,000 sets of data per month since we began July 1st. Um, as far as lessons learned, I, you know, we would urge anyone to start the planning process as early as possible. Um, despite all the different scenarios that we planned for, and we did include scenarios in all of our training, um, we trained all of our personnel statewide during the second quarter of this year. Um, obviously, for smaller agencies, that might be a little easier. For us, with over 7,000 personnel throughout the state, that was logistically a challenge, so I'd urge everyone to start planning as early as possible um, and to include scenarios in your training. We had a lot of unique aspects for our agency, such as commercial vehicle inspections and other things that didn't fit the norm of a traditional stop, so we had to plan for and account with that. Um, I also want to thank and recognize DOJ staff, um, Aaron and Kelsey and Shannon and everyone's been great to work with and help navigate and guide us through the process. So I would urge agencies to engage with DOJ as often and as frequently as possible. Um, auditing procedures are very important. Uh, despite the training, despite the policy, despite the screens and the directions, we still had some officers that we discovered were still entering inadvertently PII information in the narrative field. So that's something we're working to resolve and we believe we will have that resolve, of course, before we submit any data to DOJ. Um, I'd also encourage agencies to collaborate with one another. Um, talking to LAPD and some of our partners, they've discovered scenarios or situations that were unique that required some thought with regards to how data is coded and entered. Um, as far as how we plan to use the data, we're, we're, we plan to continue collecting the data um, and assessing it and analyzing it internally as well as we always have. Um, one thing that we've done is we have also required our officers, which we've always done, to continue collecting uh, non-discretionary stops. So traffic collisions, um, motorist services, things of that nature. So we will sort of have a baseline for comparison. We plan to continue to use that 
to identify any trends, any deficiencies, or any training opportunities, you know, of course, with the ultimate goal to continue to ensure transparency and accountability with our data. Um, and that's, that's really all I had to keep it under five minutes. Any questions I'll be happy to take now or later as well. Yes. Okay, hi. Thanks for coming. Great. Um, I'm just curious whether um, you've had a chance with this early data to review it and um, how far from sort of, you know, compliance with the regs, uh, whether you're finding it helpful, whether it's identifying problems or successes on a officer level or division level or geographic level that you're finding helpful to identify both problems and solutions. Uh, it's, it's a little early for us. We have not yet looked at trends or issues at that level. Uh, our primary focus has been just ensuring the complete and accurate capturing of the information and, of course, stressing that those narrative fields are being completed correctly without PII. So that's been our focus the first couple of months. We haven't yet got to that point. Okay. Uh, how much additional time has it been for the officers to fill out the data? Has it been any type of How's, how's the morale been in regard to filling out this extra compliance data? Uh, that, that's a great question. When we did the training, I personally went out and did all the train the trainer sessions throughout the state. That was a question we got a lot from our folks, was this is going to take a lot of time, it's going to take me away from the road, and the message that we taught our officers, and because it's really important to achieve buy-in, quite obviously, is that this is the time the people in California want you to spend is collecting this data. It's important to people. Um, and that's, that's the message that we tried to impress upon our folks when we did the training, is that this is the valuable time, this is what needs to be done. Uh, with regards to specifically how long it takes, uh, we haven't done a study to measure it. As I'm sure the board is aware, DOJ did a study prior to the uh, July 1st, which revealed I think it was about three minutes from first keystroke to last keystroke. Uh, that, of course, doesn't account for pulling over to a safe location, opening the computer, transposing notes or anything of that nature. Um, when people ask me, I, I, I estimate that it's about five minutes per stop, but I don't have an exact, uh, that's, that's anecdotal. I don't have an exact number of how long it takes. Thank you very much. come and do their presentation. Good morning. Um, my name is Monique Turner, and I am the commanding officer of the application development and support. Can you speak into the mic so we can hear you? And, and if you could repeat your name, that would be great. OK. Uh, my name is Monique Turner, and I am the commanding officer. <laughs> okay. Right there. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, Monique Turner, I am the commanding officer of the Application Development and Support Division. Uh, my division is responsible for actually um, uh, creating the application. And this is Sergeant uh, Roland Fogel, and he's part of our operations um, department. Um, so just a little bit of background. The LAPD has been collecting stop information since 2001 um, as a result of the consent decree. And so we collected a lot of very different uh, information as a result of the consent decree. And when um, we were absolved of the consent decree, then we started collecting less information. So we've had a system developed and as a result of AB 953, we just modified our system to accommodate the additional information that we needed. So our stop uh, data collection we had was about 11 fields, and with RIPA, it went up to 43, depending on what type of stop, just to give you an idea of what our officers were doing before and now what they're doing after July 1. Um, our data is submitted um, via uh, the uh, secured file trans uh, transfer protocol. Um, we have three methods of doing um, data collection. So our officers can, ha they have a mobile device. Our application works on our mobile devices. 
Uh, they can do it in their cars or they can do it in the um, back at the uh, divisions. Our percentages right now, our officers are still more uh, comfortable with going back to the office and doing it. So about 67% is done at the office, 19% uh, is done in the vehicles, and 13% is done on the mobile app. Um, so in terms of trying to get our officers um, trained, we produce several uh, special orders which mandates our officers on what they shall uh, collect, and we also had um, online training for all of our officers to complete. We actually did a pilot with a subset of uh, divisions and MTA so we can get a feel for it. And we had a soft launch starting June 18th. Um, regards for auditing, where we, what we do is the officers enter the information and once they hit submit, that submit then goes into a supervisory queue. A supervisor within that division has to review for PII information, and once they check off that it's been approved, then that's when we push the data to the DOJ. So we push our data weekly um, and to ensure that the data is correct based on the technical specifications provided to us by the DOJ, we put in all of those audit, those auditings within our application to do those validations. Um, so one of the things that, we, that was pointed out uh, by the DOJ is that we are having issues with the PII information. And so with that, um, we're going through another set of training to ensure that our supervisors are doing the, or reviewing uh, the, PI, the narrative information and that our officers understand not to put in Officer Smith. One of the safeguards we attempted to do, and it's, it's not foolproof, is that we, um, in our narrative information, we do not allow officers to type in numbers so that they cannot type in a serial number of an officer or a driver's license number or a license plate. And with the um, issues with the PII information, we also have another validation where we review our uh, employee name databases because we have first and last names. So if an officer types in Chavez, that record will not be saved because it's going to appear as a name. The downside is Chavez can also be a street. So it's not foolproof, um, but it, that is one mechanism to try to help um, to ensure that we're not entering PIA information in there. Um, one of the things that, um, one of the issues that we've had or uh, we discovered right before we went live was the collection of information for the homeless. We have a very large homeless population and for the reason for stop, there's nothing that says welfare check. Um, so right now, any data that's being collected when we do a welfare check is being routed to suspicion of a crime. For our data purposes, we've added an additional column to say, that says welfare check, but we map it per the specifications of the DOJ to suspicion of a crime. So when we post our open data, it's going to show that it was indeed a welfare check. When the public sees it on the DOJ side, it's going to show suspicion of a crime. So we would ask that that additional reason be added to on um, the next release of the um, of the of the uh, the questions. Um, it takes, we have a timer, it takes about seven minutes to complete a stop record, and that's not at the incident level, that's at the person level. So if there's two people within that stop incident, it's about seven minutes per person, and that's the average. And um, Lieutenant, Fogel, I mean, uh, Sergeant Fogel can give you more information about costs. Okay. Good morning, members of the board, members of the public, and uh, partner agencies. Just to address, I believe, a question that came out earlier was the amount of time it takes to do a stop. Um, you know, the Los Angeles Police Department has been committed to this program, and, and I want to thank the California Department of Justice. They have been fabulous to work with. Uh, coming, you know, I came in late to this program, uh, but they have been a fantastic group to work with as far as making adjustments and trying to facilitate the rollout of a fairly complex program for our department. 
But to give you some indication of the workload, which I think was the, the root of the question that was asked, that our officers are facing at that seven minutes for a large agency like ours, uh, let me give you this example. And that as of yesterday, uh, or from June 18th this year when we did the soft launch of our program uh, till yesterday, the Los Angeles Police Department officers have completed over 261,000 field data reports, which is our term for the application that we use. And that, if we use that average amount of time of seven minutes per stop, that equates to over 30,000 labor hours that our personnel are spending uh, to uh, collect the data and get it inputted. That does not incorporate supervisory oversight or supervisory review time or any, uh, any time or effort that uh, Ms. Turner and, and her team put into this. So if you take those numbers and you look at them over what uh, the resource impact it has on an organization our size, projected over a year, you're talking about almost 70,000 labor hours to collect the data um, and uh, a cost uh, of about $9.2 million if those, uh, if those rates continue the, the way they are right now. Um, Monique already had the heavy lift, and I think we're happy to answer any questions that the board might have. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. But, uh, <laughs> and I, I'll just talk loud. So I have a question about the um, going back to the office and filling out um, some of the stop mm -hmm. information. So would that be at the end, just for my clarification, of the officer's shift? And um, log just logistically, does that mean sometimes it goes, if the officer can't complete the data entry that day, it's going on to their next shift? Could you just walk us through how that works? I think, yeah, I think I can, if you want to tackle this one. So uh, we don't place a requirement uh, on the officer on which device they're going to use, how they're going to input the data. For those who choose to go back to the station and, and do it, it may very well be. Hi, thanks very much. Um, since LAPD has been collecting this data since 2001, I think it would be really helpful just to maybe get a high-level summary of your sense of how the data has helped the department. What changes have been made? I mean, this is 17 years, right? So um, what impacts has this had on department policies and practices? And um, do you find the data internally helpful? Because, of course, internally you have all of the data, right? You have officer-specific data, division-specific, station-specific. Um, so has that helped the department? Has the department taken steps um, that it's been led to by having that data? And you know, have, have there been positive trends around uh, profiling and other problematic issues that arise during the stops? Um, our data is used for our early, infor um, early intervention system. So that information is collected and it's used as part of the algorithms to identify officers who are uh, step out of their, of their particular threshold. So that's what the data is mainly used for. So going back from 2001 to I think maybe 2005 or six, there was a RAND study done about the data to see what the output was. And I believe at the time it was really inconclusive. Um, so the, the short answer is we, the only, we only use it for our early in intervention system. We have not done any other types of studies um, with this new data to see what benefits it has on or, or, or changes that it has on our officers. Um, we are in partnership with the UCLA Policy Lab, and perhaps they may do a research study on that to look, look at, the, at the data later on, but at this point, we just use it for our, as, as one of our de determining factors for our early information system, or our, our early intervention system. Okay, thank you, and, and I'm just wondering, has there been any assessment, either formal or 
anecdotal or within the department of the success of the early intervention system that this helps you flag? Um, yes, there has been a study, and with the, um, and that you can go to the, to our police commission website that there is a, a study there. And so with the implementation of the teams or the uh, risk management information system, there has been a decrease in the types of incidents that occurs because now when certain incidents happen, it's required, required that a supervisor review that incident and see if their actions meet within the guidelines of the algorithm that we have set within our application. Great, thanks. Um, and when we get to the um, report section, Andrea, I was just, you know, I think some of these lessons from departments that have been collecting similar data for a long time could maybe inform the report with um, sort of more muscular or deeper specific recommendations since they've already been trying to grapple with this. My question is, uh, in the same spirit of uh, board member Szilard's, with respect to understanding how you all's process could help us inform our own uh, moving forward. So I heard you, thank you for your presentation, speak um, specifically to the notion of, and, and the request for DLJ to be considering the difference between a welfare check versus um, suspicion of a crime. Correct. And so one of the, the questions uh, that arose for me is, has there been any uh, tracking or reports or summaries that you all have where welfare checks uh, for the public ultimately turned into either a use of force or ultimate suspicion of a crime? Um, I'm raising this because this, this came up in our conversation over the last year uh, and a half of trying to understand the, the notion of when someone in the public is stopped and at what point does that, you know, are, are we recording what it is that we're, we're recording? I'm just interested, particularly because we've seen a series of uh, welfare checks on the public ultimately and in the death of a citizen in the community. And so at what, I'm just interested um, around whether you all tracked any of that, whether there are any, num you know, reports or summaries that, that are understanding the when that welfare check has turned into suspicion of a crime or use of force. Um, and then just interested, you know, as we get to our report to think about how we might include that as well. Um, we haven't done any type of analysis yet. We just added an additional column to or additional column to identify that it was indeed a welfare check. But that's something that we can definitely do because we track that information. Been able to document whether or not there's actually been racial profiling? We haven't done any type of analysis on, on the data as such. We're just trying to ensure that we are collecting the data and that we're complying with RIPRA at this point. I guess my question is if just collecting the data without any analysis, what, what's, what's the purpose? Um, we were mandated. <laughs> so since July 1, we're just, we, we've been working with the DOJ just to, to collect the information to make sure that we're, we're gathering it. I'm sure in the future we will do analysis, but right now we're just trying to make sure that we are following the mandates of, of AB 953, that we're collecting information correctly and that we're pushing it up to the DOJ. Yeah. In the in that you have indicated that you collect the data because it's mandated. In your collection of the data, and those who have been doing it with the department for 17 years uh, in LAPD, and the mandated process has been now a little bit better than two years, uh, in your, uh, I can't call it analysis because you don't do it yet, but somehow it has to cross the department's mind uh, that this is worthwhile, it's not worthwhile, it's effective, it has no possibility of having any kind of uh, long, long term uh, effect in changing things or writing matters. Uh, it just concerns me as to whether or not uh, in the department that you've been doing that now 17 years, is there any kind of indication of the worth uh, of the process and then some indication to us as to whether or not our assembly here is worth the process. 
So the collection of AB 953, uh, the AB 953 data started July 1, so we've been collecting that data for the past three months. Um, the data that we have collected in the past, it is used for our early um, intervention system. So there is a benefit there. There has not been any additional analysis since the implementation of AB 953. And, Andrea, um, I think this has been a really important conversation, and I really thank you guys for being here. Um, but I wonder if, it seems to me maybe at our next meeting we could schedule time to get more deeply into this question, because I think, I'm sure we all agree that <clears throat> we're not trying to further data collection for data's sake. And so th this is really getting into some deep questions about um, how the data is used. Um, at the end of the day, we have to rely upon all the law enforcement agencies in the state to, um, to assess the data, to use the data. Um, we have to rely upon and, and support law enforcement to address racial profiling. Um, so transparency is terrific, but you know the, these issues about to what end. So I think it would be great to have a, a good chunk of time to talk about that and, and to learn from departments that have been collecting the data, to learn more deeply about the early intervention system or whatever other ways uh, individual departments can use this data because you know we in the public will not have much transparency, right? We won't know. Uh, except for sort of aggregated data. But department command staffs will have all of the data that they could possibly need that's officer specific and station specific, et cetera. So I, I think that's really where the meat of the progress is gonna have to come from. I think that's an important conversation and, and we can explore with DOJ whether, whether we can get that onto the next agenda. And um, we will, just to remind the public that as part of the 953 mandate, we will have an analysis at the aggregate level of the data that's coming in from wave one, then wave two, then wave three, and ultimately all of the law enforcement agencies across the state. So that will give us a bird's eye view of what's going on in the state. But uh, you're right, there's a deeper level of analysis that could be done at the agency level um, to, to improve the relationship and the, the work done in law enforcement with the community. I just have a quick question. You had mentioned that um, there was a RAND study um, on the data that had been collected previously. Correct. Could you remind us when that study came out? I want to say maybe between 2004 and 2006. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that was um, looking at um, only LAPD data? Only LAPD data, correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, one more thing it seems that it would be good to learn about is I heard you articulate around the early in intervention system and the Correct. way in which the data has been used around that. It would really be helpful for us to learn maybe next year in some of our board meetings where departments, how they have been using whatever data they've been collected for these early intervention systems, what they do, how that informs discipline for officers, how, how that informs new hiring practices, et cetera, um, because equally, you know, uh, I am concerned that we would just collect data and, you know, like the city I'm from in Oakland, when, when the data report is released, then oftentimes just law enforcement community argue about its, its legitimacy or not, and it's never informing any actual practice change. So it'd be great to see what some of these early intervention systems are doing or are not doing so that whatever it is that we can be making recommendations around what should be constructed can build off of both those successes and failures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd like the comments of my colleagues on the board saying thank you for being here and for presenting this information. It was very insightful for me uh, as a representative of California Police Chiefs also as, as of the board. I'm very interested to learn more about the algorithm uh, that you referenced uh, in analyzing the data, and that will also help, I think, inform our conversation around how to contextualize the data, how to interpret it so that it is uh, as meaningful as it can be uh, for our profession and also for our community. So I don't know if that's something we can do today, maybe not, but certainly something I'd like to hear more about in the future. So I just want to say thank you for, uh, for coming here and for answering our questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Is the algorithm something that you can um, shed more light on? It's um, very, very high level. We use several different types of information to collect um, to create our threshold. So we use contacts. So 
The stop information is considered our contacts with the public. Um, we use our CAD data, uh, uses of force, um, the, and based on each of the different geographic areas, these algorithms are done um, to identify, okay, if you have these many contacts and these, these many arrests, then it's normal to have one use of force or two uses of force based on mm -hmm. your peer group. So if you're in an area that has a, large, a larger population of arrests, then your threshold of having more uses of force or having um, higher contacts with uh, the public would be much higher. Mm -hmm. um, if you're working in an admin unit and you get into a use of force, that will trigger an action item for us so a supervisor can, re can, be, can review and, and determine, okay, was this person, why did this use of force happen and what training or disciplinary inf uh, action can be taken? That's mm -hmm. very high level, but we can always mm -hmm. give you more information about um, the, our earlier information system. So it sounds like it's a use of force algorithm as opposed to a demographic based algorithm? It's not, I just used use of force as, okay, as an example, gotcha. but we collect use of force, complaint information, um, vehicle pursuits, um, collision information, um, and lawsuits. All that information is, is gathered. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? Uh, I had a training question. I guess I could ask CHP the same question. Um, we are developing a video. In training your officers, are you using videos as to how to conduct the, the or collect the information and, and gather it? And is that part of the training process? And if so, can we get access to that in conjunction with our developing our video? We did not have a video. We had like more of a power. Well, it was a video, but it wasn't like the mock that you were uh -huh. you were asking for. Right. It was about just explaining the requirements of AB 953 and what information that should be collected. Um, DOJ had provided a um, presentation, and we used some of that information about the different what if scenarios in that. But we can definitely share 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 that with you. So, in the prior collection that you were doing independent of 953 you didn't have a training video that no we did not okay it was just a special order and the information we collected was much uh, less than what we're collecting now right any other questions from the board well thank you so much for your presentation we are very much appreciated thank you thank you to ask ooh. Let the LA Sheriff to please. Uh, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, board and members. Um, my name is uh, Bill Mulder. I'm a lieutenant with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Um, and uh, today we'll be talking about our system that we created. Uh, first off, and most important, I want to thank um, the staff at DOJ, Aaron, um, Audra, uh, Kelsey, and then Sh uh, Shannon, who used to be with the um, group. They've been so very helpful with us in putting together our system, answering questions, and providing information, so we really appreciate that uh, very much so. Um, so we created our own system. The, the uh, state system, is we've uh, looked at that too, and we were kind of in creation at the same time. It turned out really well, but for our purposes, we needed something that would fit with um, our system. In the vehicles, we have computers, what are called mobile digital computers, um, and our system needed to be formatted so that deputies could use those easily. Uh, the buttons had to be big. We wanted only one page, and we didn't want to have to page through multiple pages. So our wonderful Data Systems Bureau uh, contacted them in November once the, the regulations were solidified. We had already had prior to contact with them and talks with them for the last couple of years. But uh, um, uh, so once um, it was, uh, the regulations were solidified, um, we came to them and they said they could uh, uh, create a system in about 12 to 14 months. Um, my math is really bad, but I knew that it, we only had about six or seven months. But unfortunately, they stepped up and did a fantastic job and created the current system we have. It's called the Sheriff's Automated Contact Reporting System, SACER. And uh, it does everything that the, the uh, regulations required. Um, just we did it in our format so we can capture the information. So 
Uh, part of all that, we did a uh, pilot project in June with one of our stations to make sure everything was running well, and it did. It worked out really well. Uh, some of our um, stations then went up early, and we actually then started about two weeks prior to the uh, statutory date to make sure everything was running right, and it did. We uh, didn't have any problems, uh, nothing major, nothing major technical. Uh, there were some training issues. Uh, there always are the training issues, but um, our process, we did a train the trainer process. So we trained people at all our stations, units, bureaus, and they went out and trained everybody at their particular uh, home site. Um, and uh, we're uh, also a resource for those individuals as we move forward. Um, since the beginning, the commencement of this project, we uh, get anywhere, have gotten anywhere between 21,000 and 25, 26,000. Uh, reports per month. The average time uh, has vacillated between five and six minutes. So the first, uh, I think, uh, July was 5.49 minutes for the collection, uh, the average time for a collection, and then kind of is uh, ticked down to um, 5.3 in the next, uh, the months following. So uh, we've been kind of tracking that. Um, as part of this, too, we uh, set up a system of reports that um, our, our personnel can run so they can look at the information and see um, um, where stations are at, in reporting. Um, uh, as part of this, when a deputy makes a report, the report is submitted. It goes to a supervisor at a station. The supervisor then reviews for the narrative boxes, specifically for the, uh, making sure there's no PII information. Once that review has uh, been conducted, then they hit approve, and then it goes into a third bucket awaiting uh, uh, movement to the uh, DOJ. So, um, and then part of that, we've set up different reports they can run to see how many reports uh, um, um, have been reviewed, uh, the number of days they've been waiting to get reviewed, um, and so forth. So we can get a good idea of where we are, making sure reports are getting reviewed and pushed on uh, through the system. Um, some of the questions that came up here about um, uh, what we're going to do with the information. Uh, we plan on um, having a um, probably a third party come in and review our information in an objective analysis to look at what we've gathered. We're probably going to wait till we get six months of data, which will be the end of this year. Uh, so we'll have a good swath of information for um, whoever we select to take a look at and report back to us what, what they see in it and what maybe improvements we can make or where we're doing good, where we're not doing good, and, uh, uh, and work, use the information to help fix any issues that could come up. Um, so that's going to be probably the beginning of next year. Um, uh, right now, currently, and within the next month, uh, we uh, plan on once we report the information to the DOJ and they approve it, then that information we are going to put on our county website, uh, an open data part of our county website. This particular area has information for, um, for um, deputy-involved shootings and other information that we report to the public. Uh, that's where we're going to put the AB 953 information. And on this particular, it's not just a dump area for the information. They're, they have different tools the public can use. They can go on, pull up information. They can pull up dates or, or what, what, however they want to look at the information. They can, there's charts and graphs and all that. They can crunch the information, and it's an uh, interactive way of looking at it rather than just a bunch of dumped information, and you just have to kind of figure out what you want to do. So there's different options they can pick to kind of analyze it themselves. Uh, so that, that's kind of where we're at with it. We also have a PowerPoint to review uh, kind of how our system works. If that, that's uh, to the pleasure of the uh, board, if you want to see it, we can go through it quickly. You have uh, copies of the PowerPoint um, uh, at your, uh, on the dais there. But uh, if you'd like to see it, we can do it. Sheriff's Automated Contact says, yes, I think we have time. Okay, yeah, okay. So um, this is Ramon Ron from our data systems, and this is Leo Chang. They are the two team members who did an amazing job putting together the system for us. And uh, Ramon will then lead us through the uh, PowerPoint so the uh, public can see kind of what we're doing. And then you guys also have uh, copies of those um, at your data. Before you come to the PowerPoint, I just wanted to interject something because I thought that was really interesting. Um, what we heard about the level of transparency and the availability of the mm -hmm. data that they're so I think again going to these recommendations and others we should be encouraging um, local departments cities and counties city and county government 
to do that kind of uh, of um, posting and making the both the data and the analysis of the data available to the public and make it clear that um, sort of the, the level of transparency and availability of data that is required by AB 953 is a floor and not a ceiling. And, and I think sometimes when you set a set of sort of statewide regulations, um, that can become the ceiling. And I, I think in our reports and our communications to localities and to individual departments and cities and counties, we want to make it really clear that we encourage them to go as far above and beyond um, as this department is in both the um, availability of the data to the, to the public and the analysis and the content, right? So the decisions about what would not be included and provided to the public uh, through AB 953, um, I worry that that will, people will, will, will infer that making deeper data available um, you know, at a, a geographic or station level or whatnot, all the concerns that were raised about officer uh, anonymity, um, well, those decisions could be made differently by, uh, by cities and by agencies. So I, I think it's important for the department and, and for the board to make that clear that mm -hmm. um, localities have all the power in the world to uh, provide any data they want to their public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. I think that I think we're we're all very intrigued by your presentation so far. So if you could share your PowerPoint, that would be great. Yeah, and just one more point, if I may, uh -huh. um, uh, that I think it would be important moving forward for us and for the board and for the state to, um, if we're going to analyze the information that we have, a, maybe a set standard of how we do that, because we'll go out and we're going to have it analyzed, but that could be very different how DOJ analyzes it or mm -hmm. LAPD or any other agencies. So it would be comparing uh, apples to oranges. So if we can maybe work on getting, developing some sort of uh, anal anal analysis that is uh, common and that, that it should be applied to every agency so that we'll be all speaking the same language, that could be extremely helpful so that everybody, when we do conduct an analysis, mm -hmm. it will be um, the same thing and it will mean mm -hmm. the same thing. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think in this report right now that we're going to be producing, we will be issuing best practice recommendations, not on the stop data analysis, but on other things. And I think um, that could be a next step is, is to, to lay something like that out, possibly in an interim report um, for agencies who are getting started and thinking about this. Your early work could help inform that. And I think we're, we're looking forward to hearing more about your work. And uh, Ramon Ron, go ahead. Thank you. So what you see behind you is a PowerPoint presentation we put together. It really is just a collection of screenshots that we've taken over application, just to give you a feel of what uh, the application looks like and what the deputies have to select uh, going through one, a single stop. So in the data entry, uh, this is exactly what the deputies see at the beginning. It's sort of like the dashboard has an announcement, tells them what's going on. If there are issues with the data, we can post an announcement and say, you, you know, we need you to do, focus on this because we're seeing errors or what have you. So we have an announcement there. But when they click report, it's when they initiate the report. Uh, and what they see here is their daily dashboard, and it'll show all the reports of the day. Uh, they know they're supposed to submit all the reports by the end of the shift. And if they don't submit it by the end of the shift, they can designate what's the reason why it's not being submitted at the end of the shift. So they click new report and they begin the report collection, data collection process. This is the initial stop uh, screen where it has the address and the other demographics of the stop. Uh, deputy information, they, uh, years of experience. We have employee information there that we, they, they see but we don't submit to the state, for example. And they have the assignment type uh, for the deputy that they can select and they can click next. Uh, once they've filled out the specifics about the stop, then they can start entering people if there was one or more people, person. So they click add person to initiate the first one, and it gives them the first screen. Um, we have first name, middle name, last name there, but we don't submit that to the state. And then we have the other selection criteria that is required. So once that's uh, selected, then you click next. And then we go move on to perception data, where deputy can select everything that applies, such as perceived ethnicity, um, known disability and so forth, you click next. 
uh, reason for contact, various options there they can select, and also reason for stop. And we have a we have some visual cue there that says please do not enter PII information, and we describe what PII is, is in, to some extent. Uh, so they make the appropriate selections, uh, then our narrative, and click next. Uh, action taken during the stop. There are several action taken that were uh, designated by the specifications that needed to be included, so we included those. Uh, some of them have sort of a drill down, follow up checkoffs. If, if they do, do searches, for example, uh, they have additional checkoffs. Uh, for searches, for example, we had, that, that's the contraband or evidence that was found. S select the appropriate boxes and click next. One thing I do want to mention is these boxes, uh, when we are designing the system, uh, we wanted data entry to occur at, at the mobile digital computer in the car. So my direction to my team was we need to design these screens that are legible at night and during the day. So this has a, has a night and day mode. And the boxes you see there and buttons, uh, my instructions to my team was they have to be selectable via your thumb or finger fingertip. So the boxes need to be big enough so they don't they don't collide when you click on things, uh, and minimize the up and down scrolling, left and right scrolling. So just what you see is what you take in. You select and you click next. That was that was our main priority. So results of contact, same thing. Uh, so a series of checkup boxes that you select uh, appropriately, and then uh, once you're done. You click complete, complete. Once you complete that person, then you can either submit for approval, as you see that uh, yellow button there, or you can add other individuals if other individuals were involved. So that concludes the reporting process. On the re on the approval process, when the when the reviewer logs in, our system is linked to other systems within the department, so it knows what rank you are. It connects to our Active Directory, so you it, you don't have to log in again. Um, but it knows that you are sergeant above, so it makes review available for you. If you're just if you're a deputy, it doesn't give you the review process part uh, to, for you to use. So when a reviewer clicks on a review, uh, it automatically defaults to the unit that they're assigned, and it gives a list of reports that need to be reviewed. So they just go one by one, uh, select the report they want to review, click PII, review the boxes that have PII information, make sure. There's no PI information, and if there is, they can re reject the report and send it back to the deputy. Specify a reason why it was rejected, and also if if uh, the reviewer wants to just make a slight correction and doesn't change the context of the of the reason for stop, they can make a slight correction and save. Uh, we have report searching features where uh, deputies can search their own reports uh, that they've submitted. Uh, even for administrators to search any given report that's been it's in progress or has been submitted. We have other features uh, like a Q&A that's built into the system that we constantly update so if anybody has questions they can go to the Q&A. Uh, there, there, the there are answers to questions there. There are links to the regulations there. There are links to our manuals there um, and so forth. Uh, when the system is not available online we have uh, Areas where there's no signal or the signal is very weak, uh, or if the system's down for maintenance, we created a, a two-page form. It was, it's just one piece of paper, uh, front and back, the deputies use when the system is not available online. And once it comes back online, or they're in an area of their signal, or they go back to the office, they can enter this information. And that's pretty much it. This application is fully web-based, and it requires no install on the computers uh, to maintain. So when we make updates, it's uh, automatically available to all computers on the cars. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And just one other, if I may add, um, mm -hmm. on each of the screens, they have we have a, at the top an information um, uh, decal where they can press if they don't know maybe how to fill out the particular page. It'll bring up actually the regulations, and they can read through the regulations, see what they need to put on that page, and what's required mm -hmm. exactly per the actual regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's been um, um, very helpful to through the process. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions? Thank you. This has been really informative. Of course. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And next, um, we have the San Francisco Police Department.
Good morning, members of the RIPA board, Cal DOJ, law enforcement agencies, and members of the public. My name is uh, Deputy Chief Mike Conley, San Francisco Police Department from the Bureau of Investigations. I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of our um, uh, success or not success of the implementation of 953. Okay, so for as far as the tactical implementation, um, we have three methods of entry. One would be the station computer terminal, or the second would be uh, upgraded mobile terminals, which are in vehicles, and then also our department cell phones. Uh, the system that we utilize for entry is direct entry into the DOJ system. We are the only agency that's currently using that method. Um, so it, it, it seems to be working out okay. There are some bumps in the road, as to be expected with any new technology, but uh, we are moving on beyond that. Uh, data is currently, um, we are currently looking at putting in the reviewer uh, methodology. We go directly from officer to DOJ system. We're analyzing what the, the impact would be for either direct line supervisor or a, um, a position that would review and scrub essentially all the data. And essentially, it's to eliminate the PII data and specific location. When the initial reports first came out, we had a fairly significant error rate which we identified was primarily PINI and location indicator, which is to be uh, expected, as was mentioned earlier by uh, my colleagues in the, in the field. Uh, the, the culture in law enforcement is to docu document everything to a T. So going to a system where you don't do that uh, causes some challenges, but we'll get over that. We've had 34,000 entries since late of October. Um, that's roughly, we expect that there's roughly 310 entries per day and we expect that to rise. We know from our previous system, which we've had for the last 20 years, and documenting contacts, that it's roughly about anywhere from 1,200 to 3,000 contacts less uh, in going to 953. We expect that because it's a brand new system. We went from capturing 15 fields to 39 fields, so there's a, uh, a learning issue, a culture issue that we need to get on, and additionally, the methodology by which we collected that previous data is completely different, so we can't even use it as a comparative data set. Okay, our current uh, data use and analysis for 953. Uh, in, the, in 2015, when the RIPA Board or RIPA Act was enacted, and locally in San Francisco, we enacted 96A uh, administrative reporting, which required us to report all of our demographic data, traffic stop, pedestrian stop, use of force, and officer complaints in a quarterly reporting environment to our Board of Supervisors and the Police Commission. We intend to follow that suit when the, when the reports, the annual reports start coming up. We will go back and, and parse out the quarterly reports and go back and back report on quarterly uh, statistics from the 953 data. We continue to report on the other aspects, the use of force and officer complaints at this point, um, but both the Board of Supervisors and our Police Commissioner are, are uh, very, very interested in the data that this is going to, the 953 data is going to provide. Uh, previously, um, the 96A report was reported out by our district station and specialized units. That will continue to be the methodology. However, it's all submitted uh, in unison. And again, our future analysis is going to mirror the state report. However, we're going to break it out quarterly going backwards. So it's, it's fairly easy. Um, one of the challenges we have had, though, is in looking at the data, it's aggregate data, is department uh, headings of those columns and uh, what the report, what's the state's reporting mechanism going to look like? Uh, because we want to mirror that and get it as close to possible so we can do the comparative analysis between the agencies and, and have an apples to apples comparison as opposed to uh, having standalone information. Um, in terms of our uh, previous reports, if you were interested in looking at that analytical data, that 96A reporting, it is on our website at the location and we can provide a PowerPoint uh, to the board if they so desire um, through this mechanism. Lessons learned. Uh, approximately, you know, I've heard my colleagues say there's anywhere from five minutes to seven minutes uh, in terms of data entry in the field or, or going back to a mobile data terminal or desktop application. I think the jury's out on that right now. It, I think it depends on the user's uh, familiarity with the system. And as users become more familiar, familiar with the system, that entry time will go down. However, having a stabilized version, again, we are using the state model. 
Uh, other agencies have had the luxury of developing their own systems. Fortunately, fiscally, that wasn't uh, viable for us. However, if, if there is a mobile app that's developed and familiarity should bring down data entry time. Uh, again, um, what we found is that we've had a 15% increase in administrative time that officers are out of the field uh, completing administrative duties, which includes the uh, AB 953 data entry. If we project out what that 15% looks like, it comes to about 7.25 full-time officers per year. Right, so that's roughly 14,000 hours projected for data entry at this point. Um, again, couple that with new data, new entry systems. We're not getting as many contacts as we think we normally would have. Um, we also don't know, in terms of the IT administrative components, what that really looks like right now. Um, we are in robust discussions with the state. Um, our IT folks talk quite often and always trying to troubleshoot, which is a really good thing, but we don't know. We're not factoring in. Uh, the cost for the IT component as in this unfunded mandate. Uh, and again, we're, we're, once the data starts coming out, we're going to be doing analysis on, on time, uh, how long it takes, you know, what are the mechanisms we're capturing, uh, whether it's uh, in the field, in the cars, or in the stations, and then a further analysis of what kind of time that's impacting uh, in terms of not just data entry, but time off the field. Um, and so we'll, we'll have to look at that in the future. One of the challenges that we discovered uh, recently, um, and it's not a finger pointing episode, but it's, it's a system that needs to be corrected, is there was an outage on the state system, and we were unaware of it for the weekend. Um, so while we were trying to do data entry, we knew that come Monday morning, the system had been out for the weekend, and we lost all of those contacts. We couldn't go back and replicate those contacts. So um, enhanced communications between system outages and agencies um, is, would be obviously optimal, um, but again, there's growing pains in this process and, and we recognize that. Uh, let's see, when this came online for training, the department had conflicting training and operational priorities. So why weren't we able to train everybody in, in the 30 days prior? Well, that's exactly it. We're going to June, it started of June 1, and a very uh, busy time of the year for, for most agencies. You have school out, you have events, you have vacation, you have a number of different things. So trying to, uh, uh, get a full rollout of training versus operational priorities and necessities provided challenges. We did train how to train the training environment. It worked fairly well, but it continues to be evaluated and corrected as needed. In the future, uh, we, are, we do plan to have audit implementation of what this data looks like. Again, we are reporting out to our county supervisors and our police commission. So auditing what this information actually looks like and how we can use it to um, impact training, implicit bias training, procedural justice training, that is what this is designed to do. And in terms of policy and perception requirement, we do have some challenges. Uh, AB 953 put us in direct conflict with our department general orders in terms of the LGBTQ community. Uh, there has been some very um, vociferous objections to this. Our city attorney is currently looking at both litigation, uh, or not litigation, but uh, policy by the state and by local uh, policy to see who's gonna win that argument. I think there's room for improvement uh, in terms of data collection. And I think a, a robust discussion and possibly a working group to adjust that collection methodology may be warranted. And I will entertain any questions if you have them. We have a department general order that um, essentially, uh, it's a transgender policy, it's a new policy, and uh, essentially, out of respect for the, the community we're dealing with, we asked them how they request to be uh, identified as, as opposed to perceiving. It's a huge, huge difference, and it puts us at conflict with our community. Yes, sir. You indicated some um, concern, real concern by stakeholders about collection and retention of our data. Yes, sir. Uh, could you identify the stakeholders and give a little bit more information about the concern that was expressed? The stakeholders are both internal and external. We have uh, sworn members, employee groups, uh, and then we have members of the community, especially the LGBTQ community, who are saying that we have a, a, the policy and philosophy going towards gender identification, non-binary, is changing. There's legislation on the horizon. Uh, these are members that are considered subject matter experts, and we do also have former uh, electeds 
who are a member or, or considered subject matter experts who are identifying that the methodology that we're currently using by method of perception is at odds with demonstrating respect to the individual. So typically an individual will want to be, how would you like to be identified versus how would you like me to think of you as being identified? And so that has uh, generated some concern within the LGBTQ community and they've uh, um, expressed that in writing and so the city attorney is evaluating their, their concerns. Thank you. Just so I'm clear, are you saying that your officers are asking the individuals how they perceive themselves to be? Well, sir, uh, in AB 953 format, we are not. It is based on perception. However, our general order policy does require them to ask, how would you like to be identified, gender-wise? So, if and I could get further student. clarification, are, are you asking them, are you a he, she, they? Is that what you're asking them? How would they like to be identified, yes. Versus my perception of what I think you may be. Okay. Maybe that warrants um, some further exploration. Did you have yeah, a follow-up question? I, mean, I still think that the, you know, our basic approach around perception, whether it be ethnicity or whatnot, right, it goes to um, the impetus for the stop before you've had uh -huh. these conversations. Right. Um, right. So hopefully this, you know, sort of conflict can be, can be resolved. Right. Um, they might not be mutually exclusive, I think. Right. Right. Well, there's yeah. also a foundational training issue on how do you train an officer to make that determination? What, what is the criteria for that perception? Because everybody has a different perception. And so when we go into the LGBT community, I don't know what each one looks like. Yeah, yeah. so I think the, the point of the legislation is to try to get at um, the gap between perception and reality. And so we're not interested in the accuracy of the perception. Uh, yeah, we're interested in, in, in tracking it to understand if there is, in fact, a gap, right? Um, it's not a gotcha game of, did you get my gender right? It's, a, it's, it's getting at, um, is there, are there trends, are there patterns about who is being stopped and how they're being handled? And does that have to do with their racial or identity? Agreed. It's all about respect. Hmm? It's about respect. Well, yes, it's about respect, and I think we, it's also about some accountability. I think just mm -hmm. one of the things right. that's important for us to hear both as law enforcement and the public is the purpose behind the legislation and the, the uh, strong will of Californians was really to get, I just want to, I'm not mansplaining, I just want to support what Andrea was um, sharing, is, is just this notion that we need to get at the heart, I believe what Tim was sharing as well, we're trying to get at the heart of um, what is fueling how an officer is assuming or making the choice, the decision around how to enforce uh, their role. So. Um, you know, I think certainly it's something we need to do at the board. I think departments, um, you know, SFPD, I'm a San Francisco native, um, family still there. And I think a lot of us are still very interested to, um, to we, we don't want to train people on how to say the right thing. Mm -hmm. We, we, um, we want to, to, to understand, understand yeah. how people are coming to some of the decisions they are, um, not to criticize, you know, officers but to figure out how we both are hiring the right people to be in these kinds of roles that can create the kind of community outputs and safety that we need so just in building on that yes it's about respect but also it's about us really understanding more deeply so that we can have a culture of accountability understood thank you i just had a broader question um beyond the analysis that you said you were going to do around the the time requirements um can you talk a little bit more about ways that the department is thinking that this data may be internally useful? Well, I think I, I touched on it when right. we're looking at the data, uh, implicit bias training, uh, procedural justice training for sure, uh, and then it gives captains at the station a really good snapshot on, on the information that their officers are conducting, the, the work that their officers are doing, uh, you know, individually and collectively. Um, so we can adjust uh, patterns of behavior or monitor patterns of behavior uh, to see where that's going. 
So will this data be different from, is this going to be more detailed data than what you currently have available internally? I believe it will be. And it will give us a comparative data set. We'll be able to compare agency to agency throughout California. And that's also what the intent of the legislation was. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Absolutely. And I'll please thank you. Just thank you. <laughs> Sorry, my mic's not on. Um, and our next um, and final, last but not least, is San Diego Police Department. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lieutenant Jeff Jordan with the San Diego Police Department. Um, my assignment is the Special Projects Lieutenant for Chief David Neslight within the department. More or less have been tasked and empowered to implement the projects that are important to the chief. Uh, this one definitely qualifies. So when I talk about AB 953 and RIPA implementation within the city of San Diego, it's a big project and one that I have joined the San Diego Police Department when I moved into my current position in April. It was one of my first tasks to get this up and implemented and started on time before July 1st. Um, the way I did that and kind of talk about our own unique experience was really to break it down into about five different phases. So as I go through, though, if you have questions, we'll kind of go back to those phases. Now, I would say that these phases are dynamic, they're fluid. Just because we go into phase two doesn't mean phase one stops or starts. So when we talk about the first phase, it's obviously training. Officers need to know what they're doing and why, what the legal requirements were. So our training really consisted of a variety of different things. We started off with creating a video that walked our officers through what's required under AB 953. The video opens up with a message from David Nislight laying out his expectations for each and every single officer. So as we go through that, we walk into after that what the law requires, how they will accomplish that. After we get through the video, which was a web-based video, which required every single officer to watch and sign off on, and everybody had to watch it before the implementation date, we also did lineup training. That lineup training was given by me. All nine division, all watches, every single officer. So I think within two weeks, I hit every single division, three watches a day, sometimes 16 hours a day, making sure every single officer got the training. That's what the chief mandated, that's what he wants. For us to be really clear, anything less than 100% compliance is just not acceptable. So we are striving for that and we are pushing for that. So in addition to that, we've also beyond every station, every single officer, every watch, we did another round of training in August, command training. All commanding officers, lieutenants, and sergeants were brought in for at least an hour to go through what expectations of AB 953 were and really talk about what were required. So a lot of this training still continues today, even though I guess we're now four months, five months into this, it's still ongoing. We still get questions from specialized units, special circumstances. From the previous speakers, I can tell you many of the lessons learned from them also were lessons we learned that the training has to be ongoing, it has to be consistent, because new things come up all the time. So after phase one, we look at training. Really phase two for us was just looking at the data. Like many other agencies, we have collected data for the last 18 years, albeit arguably not as successfully as we could have. Um, this is a state law. It requires compliance. We've informed our officers of that. And as we've gone through that, we're looking at numbers that range about 15,000 a month as we approach the uh, end of November. We're at about 70,000 uh, stop cards or RIPA cards submitted for our organization. So that sounds wonderful when you think about it. That's a pretty big number, and, but <laughs> that number is really neither here nor there until you understand phase three, and that's the auditing process. You know, how are we doing? What are we measuring it against? Are we in compliance? For us, we have a unique system probably within San Diego is that we have our Argus regional database. So as we audit our data, what we're looking at, bless you by the way, uh, what we're looking at in our Argus data is RIPA stops by officers, RIPA cards submitted by officers, and then comparing and contrasting them against our arrest data, our field interview data, citations issued data because we don't know what we don't know until we compare and contrast against the data that's being submitted in those databases. That really kind of sparked some different questions when we started getting into that in phase three. What policies did we need to change? What procedures did we need to change? Where were we seeing different issues? 
not so much through non-compliance or inability to comply or understanding, but was also constant feedback. This is what we're seeing, what do we need to change? A couple things that we did change, uh, most of you I would be familiar, I guess familiar with Marcy's Law, Marcy's Cards having to be given out to victims. In order to get compliance under that law, we made everybody in their arrest report or crime reports put a sentence in there saying a Marcy's card were provided. We're doing the same thing now under department order for a RIPA, you know, if an arrest is made, was a RIPA card submitted and then put the line in the narrative so the supervisor sees that so they know that that card's been submitted along with the copy of the report. Other things that we've looked at, you know, obviously RIPA not required under consensual stops. However, when you look at consensual stops and you look at field interviews, do field interviews, can you have a consensual stop that's a field interview? Arguably you can. You can do a field interview on an inanimate object, a car or anything else that maybe places a vehicle at a crime scene. But going back and looking at the data, we eventually said, you know what, if our field interviews are going to end up in our ARGIS system or if they're going to end up in some kind of database that we use for future references, then every card or every field interview should have a RIPA card associated with it. So we made those policy and procedural changes. As we move through into phase three, into phase four, we start looking at reporting out. What does reporting out look like? Yeah, we all talk about data submission, and I'll get to data submission with the DOJ in a moment. But it's not just that, it's PRA requests. Our citizens are asking, what does the data look like? Where is it at? I know the city of San Diego has already given data out to citizens who have made PRA requests. That's something that we're gonna to continue to do. We're also looking at, I think the question came up regarding transparency before. So we have Panda, which is really, everything in the city has to have a cool acronym. So that's our performance and analytics department. So we're also gonna be providing our data over there for our analysis at least to the community. People can go there, they can look at the data for themselves, and they can see what it means to them. In addition to that, the PRA requests, as I mentioned, and now in regards to DOJ, we use a web-based application to collect data. Our officers are using essentially their MPS, their car computers. They're also going back into the station using the intranet. Um, when it's down, they also have forms like you've seen from other agencies. But, you know, when we talk about data collection and all that other stuff, they're getting all this data, they're moving it into a secure database. Eventually that data has to be populated over to the DOG, sorry, DOJ. So in regards to the DOJ, um, right now we just got our application. We use the same application as the San Diego Sheriff's Department, custom application. So I believe they submitted their data in mid-November, uh, November 15th. So we have now have their interface that was just given to us on November 19th. I would expect after we test that interface, our data being submitted to the DOJ will be forthcoming. I know from Chief David Nislight, he would like to submit data quarterly. Um, so that's going to be our goal where we're gonna to move to a quarter data submission. But part of that process is a lot of this is making sure all the systems work. Data collection, you know, making sure it's populating, making sure we screen out for PII information and then working with that interface with the DOJ and then getting it over to them. I think a lot of people have talked about lessons learned and challenges. Um, you know, right now, you know, we look about reporting out kind of being phase four. Phase five is also the challenges of what's the impact mean? You know, like a lot of folks, we're seeing about three minutes per stop. Our application is such that, and the better they get at it, the officers get at it, it's about three minutes or stop. So it's a little bit less than maybe some of the other folks have talked about in their applications. We are hearing from officers, the more they feel comfortable with it, the faster it gets. With that being said, that's only if all the systems work right. They're web-based applications. The city of San Diego is roughly 350 square miles. The internet goes up, the internet goes down. Sometimes we have problems. In addition to that, um, the challenges for the future for some agencies that we learned, if your IT network is not up to par, we, um, we have infrastructure challenges within the city of San Diego. If anybody's ever been down there, you constantly hear your roads are bumpy or different things. Well, IIT network sometimes re resembles our roads. We have some different fixes that we have to make. So what you really find out with that is if the internet goes up and the internet goes down, the officers have to collect that information on a card. They have to go back to the station. They have to implement it. We require them to implement it before the end of their shift as the law requires, absent exigent circumstances. However, should the system be down, we lock our officers out after 24 hours. After 24 hours, they can't submit data. The only way they can submit data or turn on that information is it has to come directly to me, and I have to get a note on it. Part of the reason was that for design. 
We wanted our officers to understand the importance of this. And if they didn't get in within 24 hours and we looked at their stuff, they get to write me a nice little memo and give me a hard copy of their data that they collected via a hard form. That ponders or at least causes a unique problem for us because now I have these notes and different reasons and sometimes it's not their fault. Sometimes the IT network has gone down. Sometimes there was different, you know, extenuating circumstances. But we're having those conversations about compliance and getting it done. But I put it out to the board. You know, one of the things that we constantly hear is data manipulation. Is it going to be manipulated? Is it going to be somehow touched or integrity or anything else? Because we lock our folks after 24 hours, it was really important first and foremost for us to make sure that they comply. But now is, should we open that system back up? Should we now have a system that we input that data so it's part of the overall data that's submitted to the state? That's some of the different direction that, you know, would be good from the, the board here. In addition to that, PRA requests. Some people handle PRA requests differently. I think we're unique in that we're putting that information out when it's requested. When it's requested by a person or an individual, group, organization, reporting group. I don't know if everybody who's submitting data is currently doing that. For some folks, it might be that data is in draft form until it goes to the DOJ, and once the DOJ finalizes that data, then they'll respond to a PRA request. I don't know if that's a conversation that the board needs to have and direction needs to have in the future. Also, some of the things that we're finding in is when we audit data, what are some of the ways where data doesn't match up? Some of the unique situations that we've run into, for instance, are owner responsibility cards. Whereas you're citing the person in the car for maybe a motor vehicle violation, but you find out the car is not registered, no insurance, anything else. You may write a citation now to own a responsibility. You have two citations, citations, but only one RIPA card. So we're trying to figure out what may trigger information that's different from one thing to the other. I think ultimately we come down to this, and I've heard this question answered, what's it all about? We don't collect data just for the purpose of collecting data. I think for the city of San Diego, at least what my goal is uh, in my current role, is really understanding eventually where is disparate treatment occur, under what circumstances, understanding that. And I'm a big fan of Dr. Eberhardt, I think one of your colleagues from the board previously. Her work in uh, Oakland, I think, is some of the research that she's done there, really, really important stuff. I think she set the tone, and it was a correct tone in that Law enforcement agencies typically crawl back and say, well, we didn't do anything wrong. We collected this data, we went where the crime was, boom. And you have that argument. And then you have folks who jump on the other extreme that anytime there's disparate treatment, even if they write, well, disparate treatment in and of itself isn't a sign of implicit or explicit bias, you have an argument that there's racism involved. I think at the end of the day, when groups come together and say, well, if disparate treatment is there, how do we come together as law enforcement and community members to remove that disparate treatment and close that gap. And I think that's where we need to go, and I think that's the purpose of the data. With that, I'll close. Any questions? Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Just a quick question. Sir? You referenced a RIPA card that you have the officers hand out to people. Excuse me? Maybe I misunderstood oh, you. Our RIPA card, we just call them RIPA card, RIPA submissions. That's the card that they're submitting the application for. Oh, okay, doing. so it's not so, like a Marcy's card. Sorry, no, no. Okay. But we actually have them documented like they would a Marcy's card on their reports so the supervisor can see it. Got it, thank you. Yes, you said you had a video that you uh, used to train officers. Yes, sir. Would it be possible to have that video uh, given to the RIPA board so we can Absolutely, take sir. a look at it? If uh, the DOJ requests it, we'll forward it up to their attention. We actually have made it part of our open portal. People have made it as part of their PRA requests. So I think the last group we just put it out to was KPBS, so it might be online somewhere. But I will make absolutely certain that your board gets it, sir. And one more thing, being a San Diegan, are, are you giving out annual reports based on your findings? I think the expectation is really twofold. I think the purpose with the DOJ was, you know, to collect this data, the community members are going to want an independent, thorough study of it. They're going to want that report back. We're going to look at it ourselves and like a lot of other agencies yet, you know, it's just relatively new for us, so we haven't done that study yet. But I will tell you that we are in basically negotiations now to bring in an outside provider uh, to look at our data and give a thorough, independent analysis of that, that, that data uh, to our to our city council and to our mayor's office and kind of do that. We'll do our own internal studies as well. But then I hope that the DOJ will do kind of an aggregate of all the groups that are collecting it and putting that out there. But I think it's important that we put it out there in a variety of different ways. One, we make it useful to people to go to open portals to take a look at it themselves. Two, to do that independent thorough analysis probably by an academic partner. 
Three, our own internal study, and I'll be honest with you, right now, we are having some staffing issues. We are actually uh, recognize how important this is. We've been given the authority to hire another analyst, basically to do this kind of work full time. Um, that's been the support that we've gotten from the council and the mayor to do that, so I'm very, very happy to report that. And, and we're gonna do it in a variety of different ways, sir, so yes, sir. Great, I have a question, I'm yes, also San Diegan. Uh, what is the relationship that you have with the sheriff's office? I know you're using their interface. Do they have a, a role in clearing the information before it gets to DOJ? Our relationship is they've been kind enough to give us their technology. That's the extent of it. So they, we have a very, very small IT department. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be honest with you, I have IT envy every time I go over to the sheriff's department. They have mm -hmm. a very robust staff, a lot of personnel. We don't have anywhere near that. Mm -hmm. So our relationship really begins and ends with just taking their technology, what they've provided to us. So we've incorporated their application and we're going to be incorporating their interface so we can provide that information to the uh, Department of Justice. Um, but that's really it. Um, I will say this as far as any other relationship, it's important for the agencies that are currently involved in this to rely on one another, to learn from one another and to share experiences. So I do meet regularly with them and their committee. Uh, our committee really consists of myself and the head of IT and then the chiefs when we kind of get together to make sure that we're making forward progress. So it's nice to learn from them. And then we've also, I think both groups have been involved in really starting to talk to your second wave deployments and kind of mm -hmm. that relationship exists as far as learning from one another moving forward. And I think this presentation for me and listening to the various presenters mm -hmm. from outside the agency has been helpful as well. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. The economies of scale that you get in a county where you have 13 law enforcement agencies, um, if you're using one system and not developing each your own, that makes sense. Um, we have previously queried whether, um, you know, whether there would be, in the auditing process, the, the security of, of the integrity of the data. Um, your answers have helped clarify that for us, and, and we look to further understanding how the sheriff, in this case, or sheriffs in, in other parts of the state, are going to be interacting with um, municipal law enforcement authorities to achieve some economies of scale, to, um, to assist and help in technical assistance and in other ways where we might not have it in the smaller agencies. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Anybody else? Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. All right. So I think that takes us to the end of the, the presentations. And... Yeah, we are we are at I think 11:40ish. And then we got the board discussion after the meeting. Yeah. yeah, that sounds like a good plan. So why we invite public comment on the presentations that we've heard thus far. And after public comment, we'll take a break and we'll return to discuss for a full discussion afterwards. And if you're interested in public comment, if you could come forward to the microphone. Go ahead. Uh, Melanie Ocho with the ACLU of Southern California. I want to say thank you to all the law enforcement agencies that gave those presentations to really help us better understand what is going on on the ground with the practice here. There are two things that I wanted to just um, underscore with some of the presentations that we had. First is the importance of the audit. I believe the San Diego Police Department was the only agency that I at least heard expressly discuss auditing the accuracy of the stop data as it's collected, so making sure that the stops that occurred are actually reflected correctly in the data that the officers um, are collecting, meaning not missing actions, not missing stops. Um, all the other agencies, I believe, just focused on um, whether certain uh, identifiable information was included in the, in the data or other type of errors in the data, not whether or not it was actually consistent with what the officers were doing. And again, I wanted to raise this as something that I think is very crucial to the community to making sure that when we talk about data integrity, it's not just about whether the data is being um, edited after the fact or um, not retained properly, but also that it's actually reflecting what is happening in the streets. And again, requesting that the DOJ take um, 
active steps in making sure that that is occurring, that those types of audits are occurring. Um, just as anecdotal um, experience, a colleague of mine at the ACLU of New York, who all, where there is also um, mandatory data, stop data collection, had a case involving uh, nine individuals, I'm sorry, in, uh, nine individuals, and none of their stops had actually been reflected in the stop data that was man mandated by the state, although there's, those stops were reflected in other data that the, uh, that the agency had collected. And so that's just underscoring the importance of making sure that the stop data is accurate um, and doing, engaging in an audit process. Um, because there is no identifiable information about individual stops um, under a RIPA being collected, that type of actually comparison is not even possible here. So it's, it's hard to know how, um, if the DOJ is, is only willing to become involved if they're being flagged that there's um, non-compliance, there, it's really difficult to understand how that information would ever come up to the DOJ without having some kind of um, ongoing, whether it's random, whether it's um, engaged in any other kind of way, actual audit procedure that's going on at the agency level. Um, second, I want to also underscore the uh, request from some of the agencies from the DOJ to provide guidance on uh, department level analyses that it could be doing. I think the agencies that we heard from today have a lot more resources than many of the other agencies that will be coming on in the future waves. And so I think that's going to be even more beneficial and more necessary as we get further down the line with agencies that don't have the dedicated resources um, that some of these agencies have that the DOJ is providing really clear guidance on how they can analyze this data so that they can make it useful for themselves. Um, and hopefully we can pr get that um, uh, as part of what the DOJ is providing um, as it moves forward. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. Sir? We'll, we'll take you in turn from each side. Two minutes each so that we have time and there's going to be another round of, of public comment later. In the yeah, Yes, so if you could keep your comments to two minutes that would be helpful. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my, uh, my name is Michael Dunn. I'm a co-chair of the Riverside Coalition for Police Accountability. Our group has been in existence since 1998, uh, when Taisha Miller was shot to death by members of the Riverside Police Department. Our effort has been to bring uh, a system of citizen review of police abuse of force to Riverside. Along the way, we have been concerned about a lot of things that uh, you all are also concerned about. And I was very interested to hear how uh, various agencies are trying to comply with the, the law in terms of reporting. But uh, one of the things that I think will be needed from the data you collect is a more, much more granular approach to the analysis. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure how you go about that because you may not be collecting all of the information you need. So for example, um, in our work with the Riverside Police Department and the citizenry of, of Riverside, we've been concerned, for example, about uh, questions such as the level of education of the officers, the ethnicity of the officers, the um, incidence of uh, lateral transfers from one police department to another, and how those officers perform in their new setting, why they were involved in a lateral transfer, for example. Um, the gender of the officers. So all of these issues may have an effect on how abusive force occurs and to what extent there is bias, there is uh, profiling going on. So I don't know how you capture all of that information along with the, the information you are capturing. Thank when you, I, sir. I, we, I, thank you, sir. Let me say one more thing. Okay. If you look at page 40 of your draft report, I think it's easy, maybe too easy, to draw the conclusion, yes, there is a problem. Thank you. Thank you. And we, we now have a timer, and Kelsey has a sign to help guide you. 
Awesome, thank you. I promise I'll be short. Good day, everyone. My name is Denise Booker, and I am a law enforcement employee. I have nothing but respect for my brothers and sisters-in-law. There's two things that I'd like to address. One would be the time that was mentioned mm -hmm. to implement the RIPRA, and every day, things are changing. New things are adding. It's going to get faster with time. So that shouldn't be a problem at all, because this is needed. Um, secondly, I'd like to commend Los Angeles, because the, the explanation of the algorithm was perfect. It, it works, and so thank you very much for that. Now, this is what my problem, my issue is. I'm the mother of three, one of which is I have a son. Every day that my son went outside, regardless of the fact that he had no issues, had never been in trouble, um, the anxiety and fear that I felt as a mother is unexplainable. Mm -hmm. My son never got in trouble, but that fear that I had, this program is needed. It's needed, and it's never been needed more than today. So I applaud you all for taking the time to work on this and get it done right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bobby Butts, and I just want to say, so once um, things get rolling with uh, the police departments and they're submitting their data with DOJ, I want you to know, so when DOJ gets the data, how will you guys disperse it out? And if you guys do disperse it out, would you go from city to city and say, hey, look, y'all are messing up, or y'all need to do this, or will it come with recommendations after the data is collected? Uh, that's a good question, and I think, um, you know, the, the analysis, we're in a collection okay. year right now, and the analysis won't come for another year, and I think your question is a critical question that we will take up uh, before so we do the analysis. You guys have a great day. Thanks. I have a couple concerns about uh, a lot of the talk about data, uh, particularly concerned about, you know, possible misconduct by police officers uh, getting data. Uh, it's about 25 years ago, it's like we were asking the Los Angeles Police Department to stop collecting data. I don't know if anyone knows that. Uh, they had a department that was collecting data on religious organizations, activists, politicians, celebrities. So I'm very concerned about how data can be misused with law enforcement to basically expand you know, their power when in in fact, we're just trying to, you know, reduce this bias. I'm also concerned of how the data could be reflected. Um, I don't want to see the data uh, reflect, uh, reflect something that's not true. So, for instance, we could see data that, you know, is more qualitative, where I'm looking for, you know, data that addresses problems in the community versus data that's going to reflect a bias in policing. And that's one of my biggest concerns going forward. Uh, also, uh, I'm, I have some concerns not just about, you know, just this data, but the police and the relationship that we're seeing with, uh, we're seeing with the police and district attorneys, uh, and we're talking about being profiled. I've been profiled. I've been secretly followed to my car. I've been arrested multiple times. I've never been uh, convicted of any crime, uh, but because of the color of my skin, it's just something I have to put up with. That's what I got to live with. And you could take my life and do the data on that. So I just want to put that out there. Please consider it. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. My name is Shawnee Beeman. I'm a lifelong resident of Riverside. And I'm one of the founding members of the Riverside Coalition for Police Accountability. As Dr. Dunn said earlier, we've been working on police accountability issues here in Riverside for uh, 20 years now. And I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing life into this important endeavor, taking a law and making it, really applying it. And I want to thank you for coming to Riverside and showing us 
how smart you are, <laughs> all the really good questions that you're asking, the process that you're following. You know, when it all happens up in Sacramento, you know, it, it's really uneven. And so I know it takes a lot to come into a community. And so I want to say thank you um, to you as individuals and you as a, uh, as a group. Um, a couple of observations. One is it is important to track the time that it takes for officers to fill this out. You know, um, that's a form of accountability. Um, but I also want to be very careful about not looking at it as, oh, it's too much time. This goes to the heart of the integrity of law enforcement mm -hmm. and justice issues. And it is as much for the integrity of the officers as it is to the data that is happening. So while that's important information to gather, um, please don't make decisions based on that. I also want to do a shout out for what looks like LA Sheriff's Department's really good job at taking this seriously, collecting that data, and also making it available. And I think that's what's going to be a really important factor to this. Having an open portal. It's great that you guys are going to be doing analysis. It's great that the department is going to do analysis but also having the tools to do analysis outside of what you've already thought of. That's how we're going to move forward. And um, so thank you very much, and we look forward to more work. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm uh, Benjamin Reynoso. I'm a concerned citizen, I guess you would say. I just moved back to the area. I have some different intentions. but. Uh, I work in foster care in South Central of Los Angeles, and I've seen, as case manager, I have to fill out the statistics, and with uh, SCRTP regulations, which kind of looks like RIPA to police, we now have to update a census on who's there, the ethnicity of the child, et cetera. I can pretty much guarantee that half of you on this panel right here can identify what I am. And that extends to what my next, uh, I guess, implementation, which I would recommend, because you seem like the board to do it. For cities like uh, Los Angeles, I've had a lot of close cooperation with the LA Sheriff's Department, sadly, because some of our youth just, we just can't, we can't deal with them beyond a certain extent, and they become a threat to themselves. But the LA Sheriff also, I've seen, they don't take the kids away. San Bernardino, which isn't in attendance, is my city. They're not in attendance, and they do take people away because they ne don't necessarily, or they're not necessarily familiar with where they are policing. And we know that is fact. I'm pretty sure everybody knows that is fact. And I know it needs to be more lucrative as a career for more people to come around and do that. But the reality is that if these, this data isn't used in a way to implement some kind of routine actual assessment for who would be more effective and who can better address this community as a community, your data is void. It's irrelevant. The same way that I'm filling out the census and not agreeing with having to fill out the census on who is in this house, because I don't understand what the, what's going to be the long term. So we want to know and keep you guys accountable also, because it's a world of liability. Everyone is professional. It's liability first and then accountability. To keep you accountable for implementing proper practices in communities. The LA Sheriff's Department, they killed it though, because I've seen it in action and it looks like they're just doing everything that I've seen live. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Felicia Jones. I'm with Congregations Organized for Prophetic Engagement and part of a multi-agency coalition called the Rethink uh, Safety Coalition is really looking at um, this issue of racial profiling and certainly bias and pushing for more training. So we're delighted to be here to see um, uh, what is happening and the accountability that, that certainly uh, we're pushing for across the state and certainly uh, in the Inland Empire region. Uh, but one of the things I hope I, I can um, raise an issue that, will, that may come up in the, re the next report, unfortunately I want to do the comment now, and that is uh, hoping that there will be some attention to uh, the reporting requirements for school police, uh, and particularly those where there are sheriffs on school campuses. We know that um, in some schools, 56% of black students are profiled, um, actually disproportionately profiled, uh, and actually have 
uh, more interaction with law enforcement, and we, we really do want to make sure that, that we're paying attention to that. I am not sure, I have not seen it in the draft, but I hope that it can be addressed. I understand that there may be different reporting requirements for schools, but I think it's important that we um, pay attention to how our students are actually being uh, certainly profiled and targeted in our schools so that we are uh, preventing the unnecessary use of law enforcement interaction for student behavior and misconduct when it could otherwise be addressed uh, in, other, in other means. So just wanted uh, to share that and hopefully that will be addressed at some point. Thank you. Thank you. That's um, very noteworthy. Hello. Um, I don't know if anybody did this so far, but welcome to Riverside. You know, um, this is the place where like this type of type of um, data collection had happened before. I, I see it happening all over the place because people are talking about doing it for 18 years and not having no results. You know, so like the question I'm kind of composing to is that like they have collected the data for thus long and they didn't know what to do with the data. So what I'm challenging y'all is, is what's the next step? You know, because like if we collect all this data and we don't do nothing with it, what's the purpose of collecting all this data? You know, so like, I think like, we gotta start thinking next steps like even after the data collection. Because like, you know, if it's true, what are y'all gonna do? Mm-hmm. You know, and like, I'm not just saying this, I've got one minute. I'm not saying this because I'm the president, I'm also a client, you know what I mean? I've been racially profiled. And like, my child is young and, 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 and I'm scared of the same monster. So it's like, there's a lot of people hurt and hurt people hurt people. But we need to heal this situation because we know what this policing is standing on. We know that it stems from slave patrol. We know that the same population that they were stem from is the same population that's being heavily policed. And we gotta sit out here and do something about it. So it's like, you know, you was born for a reason. Is it to take photo ops and look like you and pretend like you was trying to make a difference? Or is it out here to make a difference? You know, so figure out what the next step is. That's it, thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to say, Terrence, I want to say thank you um, and, and for welcoming us into Riverside. And for those of you who may or may not know, Terrence helped facilitate this location for us today. So thank we're you. grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Vonia Quarles, and I uh, live in the inland region. Um, I'm a member of All of Us or None and the director of a small nonprofit that works in reentry and a um, third generation convicted felon and a practicing attorney now in the state of California. And I, I recognize the intent and purpose of 953. And living in Riverside County, oftentimes things are legislated and mandated in Sacramento. And by the time it gets here, it's implemented anyway. Um, that the power structure here decides to implement it. And so while I commend the work that you all are doing, I would actually urge you to consider standardizing what's done throughout the state. So every policy that's changed like during the past five or 10 years when it comes to criminal justice or even human services, it looks quite different in its implementation. And I do not want to be sitting in a county that's so far south that I feel like I'm in the south. And so what we're asking for in this county is that you standardize a process so that we don't have to sit here 17 years from today and say, we have the data, but we haven't looked. We don't even need to look at the data. We know, we've lived it. 
We've been profiled for decades, and so we've lived it, and we're asking you to continue to be as diligent as you are in requiring that whether a department, a sheriff's department, or a police department wants to um, take part, that they have to. Not only do they have to, but when they come here and they make a report, it has to, it has to bear weight. You can't tell me that you've collected data for 17 years and not looked at it. How can you? Who, that doesn't pass a smell test. And so, so we believe it's important to do that. We believe transparency is critical. And, and we also just want to say thank you for coming to Riverside. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we're taking one from each side. Just a moment to get to my height. How's that? <laughs> Does that work? Yes. yes Go <laughs> ahead. Thank you. Thank you for coming here today. I have a question. This report is all about the victims. What do we learn about the officers involved in abuse of force? That's a question the Riverside Coalition for Police Accountability has been asking for 10 years or more. Especially, we're concerned with what happens from the police union. This is what happened in Riverside for the police union. When we tried to get into our city charter, the Riverside, um, Help me, Sean. The Community Police Review Commission, which we have now because we fought this fight. This appeared in our newspaper, totally changing what it was we were trying to do and instead saying, don't tie my hands when it comes to your safety. Support the Riverside Police vote no on I.I. That was when we were going through a charter review. So I ask you, pay attention to your, to your police union and what is coming out of that and help them be responsive to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matthew Sedafin. I'm a Brown Beret and a board member of a local school district that's rolling out a police department. And uh, my main question is, uh, first off, thank you for all the great work you do. It's really insightful. And it's good energy to be around folks like this in the same space. And uh, kind of echoing what other people have brought up about what's gonna be used with the data. I think it's very important to have a good framework of what the data can potentially be used for, because I, I think everyone already knows that there has been racial profiling for centuries now, um, and that's, it is what it is. And uh, from my perspective, from a school district, is really to see, I see youth who are, first off, interacting with police and uh, on that face-to-face -face level, but also developing their conceptions of, of societal order and also law enforcement, their strategies and how they relate to them, when to call the police, when not to call the police. And the main thing is to uh, really instill a sense of control with them. And with this, um, it's, it's, um, I'm trying to see how potentially to change the data that's being collected specific to the population that it's affecting. I'm not sure in the broad statewide how that could be used, but I know there's very different populations across the state that have very different kinds of interactions and experience different forms of uh, whatever you want to call it with police based on where they are and where they're from. And again, specifically for school districts, it's important to have what's the end goal in mind. For example, for me, I try to, um, trying to see what data we could collect 
that could develop their conceptual framework for law enforcement. So that in includes collecting data from the student, from the parents as well, and from their friends to kind of see the, all the factors that come into play for this. Thank you. Thank you. And so we have two more speakers and we will take a break after that. Hello everyone, welcome to Riverside. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Daryl Peden. I'm with the River, Riverside County Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. Um, one thing that was already brought up and I just felt the need to come up here as well just to emphasize it, that uh, the public is very interested in this data, in the data. Uh, but what we found is within the Inland Empire as a whole, it's extremely hard for the public to get their hands on the data, even when we do public records requests. Um, there's all kinds of reasons to why they won't give us the data. Um, so just please keep that in mind when we're considering once the data is collected and we've gone through this process that we too want to see the, see the data and just start thinking about the mechanisms that we can do to make sure that that's, that's the case. I think there's been some examples today about you know, the transparency and making sure that it's open to the public already on websites and things like that. That'd be great. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, keep up the great work. Great. And so we're going to hear from one more gentleman. If you are interested in making public comment uh, later this afternoon, you'd be welcome to. Hello. Uh, my name is Aaron Bratton. I'm very concerned, a uh, very concerned citizen. So I wanted to uh, make two points. One is, uh, uh, I guess, more of a compliment. I kind of noticed uh, reading this report that uh, it put a term put a name to uh, something that's been happening in high profile situations. They're calling it bias by proxy. So other people might know it as like the permit patty type of situation where we're having most of the times white folks calling the police mm -hmm. on black people just living their lives and it gets weaponized and they're using 911 like it's customer service and it puts uh, black folks life at, at risk. And so I really commend uh, this report for you know, addressing that specifically. Um, something I'm criticizing, uh, I guess, it's about this report about is uh, San Bernardino County sheriffs are not here. And uh, I want to lift up Luana Phillips. So when talking about racial bias and uh, prejudice, uh, a name that can be attached to that is Luana Phillips. She's 34 years old, was 34 years old. On October 2nd in Victorville, she was shot in the head by San Bernardino County Sheriffs. So mm -hmm. how often is it for someone to go to a dealership to complain that they were sold a lemon and to leave in a body bag? Right. How often does that happen? Does it happen to white women, Hispanic women? Why did she go to complain about her car and she got a bullet in her head by the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office? That needs to be addressed, but the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office is not here. Thank you. Thank you to members of the public who came forward. You will have another opportunity to do so this afternoon. And at this time, we'll take a break. And we will reconvene at 1245.